Good morning, everyone. We just want to thank you for tuning in with us here at Reedy Branch Baptist Church for our um, time in worship through our YouTube channel or, or our Facebook channel. We pray that, you are, that you've enjoyed the service so far. I'm, I'm sure if you've listened to any of the singing, you have truly enjoyed the, the messages brought through song. We pray that you would enjoy this message as we attempt to think for a few moments on the next steps. Easter has passed and what we know is that what was taking place in scripture as Easter passed, as, as Jesus has resurrected and he has shown himself uh, often to many people and to his disciples on many occasions for, for the time of 40 days, we, we come to the point in these men's life and even in, in Jesus' ministry as to what's next. So we just want to think for a few moments on, on that thought, what's next. And we're going to be looking in the book of Acts. Uh, we're going to look in the first chapter, verses 4 through 11. These are some familiar verses. And we will look at them to, to help us see what, what's next. Or see what the next steps are. Uh, if you've ever got, I, I, I wonder, have you ever gotten to the point to where, to where you've wondered in your life what's next? Usually this happens when something big takes place in our lives. Uh, sadly, this something big can be uh, bad news or it can be a difficult time. This something big can be something such as the loss of a loved one. It could be losing a job. It could be losing your home to a fire or even financial difficulties. These are, these are big and, and, and it's something that, that causes us to naturally wonder, well, what's next? However, sometimes this something big can be something exciting. It can be something such as the birth of a child or, or maybe, uh, the end of your honeymoon from, from just being married. It can be a new promotion or the closing of a new home. It could be even you accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. How exciting that, that is, you, you begin to wonder afterwards, well, what are my next steps? What's next for me? I, I remember the Sunday morning that I announced my call to preach, uh, to preach the gospel. It was... Before Sunday school began and, and I announced my call to the church and there was an excitement and there was a celebration that took place all over the church. But as soon as the celebration calmed down and the pastor led us in prayer and everybody began to go to their Sunday school class for what remaining time there was, I didn't go to a Sunday school class. So I walked to the pastor's office and I sat down and, and I asked the question, what's my next steps? And his reply was simple, study and pray because soon we're going to have you preach. Well, I knew what my next steps were after this, this time of celebration. It was to study and to pray. And, and here I, I, I'm convinced that, that maybe in the mind of these followers of Jesus, after his resurrection they're wondering well what's next well we begin to find in the book of acts a series of events that takes place that tells us what was next or or what the next steps were and when we read here in verses 4 through 11 in chapter 1 we we really see what was next or what were the next steps in the plan that Jesus had for his followers. When we look in this passage, the Bible says, beginning in verse 4, that, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. And for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? 
And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they were looking steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Oh, this is God's word for God's people. I pray that you would join me as we pray. God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your encouragement. We thank you, God, that you lead us into the next steps. So now, God, as we come before the audience to, to share your word, we pray that you would work in each and every heart to help them understand what their next step in serving you is. If they've if they know you as, your, as Lord and Savior, help them, God. Reveal to them their next steps. If they don't know you, help them to see that their next step is to receive your son as their Lord and Savior so that they can have a relationship with you. Now, God, we ask that you be with us throughout this message and we give you praise for all that's accomplished. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Well, as we begin to approach the book of Acts, it begins with the author Luke referring back to his gospel writings. Uh, he was, again, writing to Theophilus, the same man who, had written, who he had written his gospel to. Uh, in Luke's gospel account, he recorded the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ while on earth. However, here, Luke begins to take the next steps in his writing on earth. In his writing, in this new work or in this new book, he simply calls it the Acts. It, it refers to the continuing work of Jesus Christ through the power of he, the Holy Spirit, working in the hearts and lives of the apostles. With this book, the physician Luke was saying, though in heaven, the life of Jesus Christ, it continues on. So if for it to continue on, there had to be a plan. Now, we want to look here in this passage and see what see if there is a plan that's explained as we as we look here as we realize that that now Jesus' death, burial, burial, and resurrection has taken place. And, and Jesus knew that his time on earth was limited. He would have to go back to the Father. And as a matter of fact, he told his disciples before his death that it was for their benefit that he would go back to the Father. We find in John 16 and 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, that it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So Jesus is going away. Him going back to the Father did not change his plan for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be shared throughout the world. I, I remember... When I finished college, I went to work for my dad and, and he had a plan for me to go from being the lowest paid man with the lowest job to becoming, uh, to running actually the company. So this plan that I was, the, the plan was that I was going to learn the work before I learned the business. <laughs> Well, what I found out was it didn't matter that I was the only one in the company with a college degree. It didn't matter that I was the owner's son. It didn't matter that I was the one who he least wanted to see get hurt. His plans did not change because I got married. His plans did not change when my wife had our first child, his first grandchild. It didn't, it didn't change when, when I got in debt with a mortgage. His plan was going to happen his way. 
And with Jesus going back to be with the Father, he is standing with the Father's, is standing at the Father's right hand, making the intercession for, for you and me, this being necessary as Satan, the accuser of the brethren, come before God day and night making accusations against us. This still did not change God's plan. So while Jesus is there at the Father's right hand, this meant that those who believed would be left to convince the world, convince those who were perishing, convince those who deemed the gospel to be foolishness, we had to, he, he left those to, to share the fact of the power of God. We see in 1 Corinthians 1 and 18, the Bible says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are believing, who are, for us who are being saved, it is the power of God. In Romans 1 and 16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God, the salvation for everyone who believes. Yes, so Jesus' plan is for the believers to carry the gospel to the world. The only problem is how can a man, woman, boy, or girl stand sharing that God's only begotten son left the portals of glory to come to this sin-cursed world, to live a sinless life and to die a sinner's death through the humiliation of a cross so that the sin of the world could be forgiven. How would they, we be able to share that only those who would repent of their sin and receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior would inherit the kingdom of God? Well, the only way a man, woman, boy, or girl could do this and stand upon this is through the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it's, it's through the power of the presence of God himself working in our lives. It is God who empowers us. It is God who enables us to share the gospel. So now we see the plan is laid out that, that the gospel would be shared by those who believe. This plan is laid out for Jesus' disciples and they were not to depart from Jerusalem, but instead they were to wait for the promise of the Father. They must wait to be baptized with the Holy Spirit of God. Yes, we see this plan explained, but we also see the power examined. Here Jesus gives this information to, the, to those disciples that were standing around and as he shared that, that they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. A question rang out from one of them. They asked Jesus, now, are you now going to restore the kingdom of Israel. This reveals where their hearts and minds of disciples really were. They were anticipating an earthly Messiah who would rule on, on behalf of Israel. And family, I, I, I want to remind us that Jesus Christ will set up his kingdom on earth. But that time is not, that time is not now. It's, it's in the future. I, I don't know how far into the future it is. But what I do know is that no one outside of God himself knows when this will take place. But what Jesus is focusing on in this time of this writing in front of these men telling them that they would be empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. What he is focusing on was a real and a, a present rule in the hearts of men, women, boys, and girls. Jesus con was concerned with reaching the world for God and he was going to do this through the witnesses whose hearts he would rule and reign in. Yes, when we we often find ourselves hindering or trying actually to hinder the plan of God. We do this through our worry of, of that we're not able to talk to strangers. And I, I have to admit that it's not easy for me, not as easy as you would think it is for me to have a conversation with someone or to start a conversation with someone that I don't know or even someone that I don't know very well. I often wait for them to begin the conversation with me. And if that doesn't happen quickly, I begin to pray, Lord, help me. And more often than not, the power of the Holy Spirit will rise up and he will guide me and help me to be a witness of the Lord to this person. 
You know, I can't do it on my own. It's not natural for me, and I have to depend on the, the Holy Spirit of God. I have to depend on his power to work through me. Truthfully, I found that our lives can be an avenue to our witness for the Lord. What I mean by this is when Jesus rules and reigns in our hearts, our, our lives are different than they were before. What I mean is our hearts are, are ruled by Jesus, then we're not living lives that, that are consistent of adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, and lewdness. Our lives are not consisting of idolatry, sorcery, and hatred, and dissensions. Our lives are not filled with heresies, and envy, and, and murders, and, and drunkenness, and revelries. These are works of the flesh, and, and when these works are not prevalent in our lives uh, then people notice that they see that, that we're not acting as the world and they want to know what's going on and, and the simple answer is that, that God, that Jesus Christ is ruling and he's reigning in our lives folks our lives should be exampled with the fruit of the spirit when Jesus is reigning in our lives it's evidenced by the fact that we're filled with joy, we're filled with love and peace, we're long-suffering, we're kind, we're, we're filled with goodness and faithfulness and gentleness, and we're, we're, we're controlled, we're, we're filled with self-control. This same power that leads us, this enables us, that enables us to live our lives filled with the fruit of the Spirit, it will enable us and it will empower us to be the witness of the good news of Jesus Christ. Yes, in this passage, we not only see that we we not only see that that Jesus is is sharing with them the next steps and that the plan is is explained. In these next steps, not only is is the power examined, but we see that the promise is exclaimed. You know, when we look in this, in, in the rest of these verses, I, I hope we understand that all that Jesus has told his disciples, as we reflect back on that, and we have the privilege to reflect back on that because we, we're reading the word of God. But I have to imagine that some things are just reflectant in the hearts and minds of these men as they are, are seeing the next things that are happening considering what they've been through, considering what they've witnessed, considering what they've been taught, we have to think that they're reflecting even in the moment. You know, when we look in this passage, what we see is that as soon as Jesus told the disciples that, that they would be witnesses of him, they watched him be taken up and a cloud receiving him out of their sight. Now, I don't know what you're thinking as you ponder that particular event. But I, I'm sure if I was standing with those guys, I would be standing in amazement. I, uh, to see someone taken up into the heavens like that, I'm not so sure that I would believe what was happening. But this wasn't the first time someone watched someone else ascend into heaven. Uh, if we remember, Elisha watched Elijah ascend into heaven. In, in 2 Kings chapter 2, we find Elisha, he would not let Elijah out of his sight. Uh, Elijah tried to get away from him, but Eli Elisha kept saying, no, I'm going with you. And he followed him to Bethel, and then he followed him to Jericho. And, and when Elijah finally realized, I can't shake this man, he just asked him, What may I do for you before I, I'm taken away from you? And Elijah then asked for a double portion of his spirit. And Elisha responded by saying, if you see me taken away from you, then it shall be so. As a matter of fact, that happened. In 2 Kings 2, 11 through 12, the Bible says, and then, then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah, he went up by a whirlwind into heaven. 
And Elisha saw it and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. Here, what we witness is that when Elisha witnessed Elijah being taken up, he cried out, my father, my father, the chariot and the horsemen of Israel. Now, this was a cry from a young man from his heart to his father. A father who has been swept away from, from him forever. Elijah had been a spiritual mentor to Elisha. And he meant a great deal to Elisha. And he's crying out to Elijah. My father. My father. But what we see here with the, with the disciples is that they were just, as they saw Jesus taken up, they just stood there gazing. They stood in awe of what they had seen. They, they weren't moving. They were just staring into the sky. And so out of nowhere, two men dressed in white apparel appeared out of nowhere and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same, this same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come so in like manner. As you saw him go into heaven. I, I don't know if you hear this the way I do. But what I hear is a rebuke here. Here they were. They were standing there gazing. After everything they had witnessed. After everything they had been taught. After everything Jesus had shared with them. They just stood there gazing. And then out of nowhere two men began to rebuke them. It appears to me that these men were saying to those disciples, what are you doing? Jesus has told y'all that he would have to leave you. And he told you that he would be back. In John 14, 2-3, Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there, you may be also. I want to remind us, that if we've been born again, if your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life, this same helper, this same helper, the Holy Spirit of God resides in you to lead, guide, direct, enable, and empower you to do the work of the Lord. So what is your next step or what is our next step? Our next step is to trust who Jesus is, trust what he's done. We are to trust and depend upon the power of the Holy Spirit to do the work of sharing the gospel through us to this lost and dying world. For you out there who may be far from God, you who don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, you may be thinking, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he died for the sin of the world. And if I ask him, he will forgive me of my sins. But I know I can't live a Christian life. I'll just fail him. This may be on your mind. But you know what? It was on mine before I surrendered my life to serve the Lord. Truth be known, in your own power, you will fail. In my own power, I will fail. In anyone's own power, they will fail. And the Lord knew that. There's no one who can live for the Lord in their own power. And that's why God gives us his power when we surrender our lives to him. He knows we will fail, but he loves us so that he gives us himself to lead us and guide us. He gives us himself to enable and empower us. And when we do fail, he convicts us. He never condemns us. His conviction is for our correction. In other words, he makes us aware of how we've fallen. He, he picks us up so we can start back over right where we're at. So I ask you today, why, why won't you trust him? Why won't you take the next step in your life? Obey the spirit of God. Repent of your sins. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and receive the Holy Spirit of God. And then he'll make you a witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you ready today? Right there in your home, 
in your office, in your bedroom, maybe on your break from work, wherever you are listening to this message, are you ready to take the next steps? Oh, we'd love to rejoice with you as you take these next steps. If you're ready, why won't you pray with me? Just take time right now. Pray this simple prayer with me. In other words, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is the son of God, you believe he died for the sin of the world. You believe that if you would repent of your sins, to hear forgive you of your sins, that if you would ask him to be Lord of your life, that he would <coughs> come into your life and save you from an eternity spent in hell. If you, <coughs> if you believe this and you're, you're ready to accept him as your savior, would you pray with me? Join me in prayer, would you? God, we just come before you today. God, understanding that you are God and besides you, there is no other. Understanding that you love us beyond what we could ever imagine. God, I believe that you are on your throne. And I believe you sent your son from heaven to this world. To die for my sins. And God I repent of my sins today. And I ask Jesus. To be Lord of my life. To be my savior. God I thank you. For loving me in spite of who I am. For sending your son to die for me. And I thank you Jesus. For being my savior. My Lord. Now lead me. Guide me. God, you have already filled me with your spirit. Now, you lead me to be the servant that you would have me to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Oh, if you've prayed this simple prayer, believing it with all your heart, trusting the word of God, trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, oh, why won't you tell us Put it in one of the comments or you can inbox our Facebook page if you'd like. But just share that today you received Jesus Christ as your Savior. And let us rejoice with you. And if you don't have a church that you're a part of, we'd love for you to come to Reedy Branch. And we'll help you with the next steps as you've become a new creation in Jesus uh, we pray that God richly blesses each one of you. We pray that God's hand be upon you throughout this day. And we pray that you're blessed beyond our deserving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.